أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma j'al ma naquluhu wa naf'aluhu khalisan li wajhika al-kareem. Firstly, before I start with the topic of today, I would like to do a small recap of what we talked about yesterday, about yesterday's topic and yesterday's lecture. First of all, how are your hearts today? I hope they changed a little bit since yesterday. So yesterday, we were basically talking about a question that says, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not send us clear signs? And we came to the conclusion that the signs actually exist and that there's a problem with our hearts, that our hearts do not recognize the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also came to the conclusion that even if we saw the Imam of our time, even if we saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we wouldn't recognize him in the way that we need to recognize him, his rank, his true rank. Because there were people who saw the Prophet and who saw the Imams, but because they, don't, they didn't have enough knowledge to recognize the true rank of the Imam and the Prophet, they didn't recognize him the way they should have recognized him. That is why we said yesterday that Al-Shimr sat on the chest of Imam al Hussein, but did not recognize him as the Imam of his time, as the one that he should obey and listen to. We also came to the conclusion that we need to work on our hearts to purify them to clean them so that we may have al-qalb al-salim. And here I want to mention something because yesterday after the lecture, a few Shabab brothers approached me and we had a small talk and I told them th something that I would like to share with you. So when the human being is born, he is like a stone, like Jamad. He can't move, he can't do anything on his own. He needs someone to take him, to carry him, to take care of him. And then, after a while, he evolves to become like a plant. He starts growing and moving, just like how plants do. And then after a while, he evolves to become like an animal. He has desires, he can communicate, he wants to eat drink, move, go, come on his own, just like how animals do. These three stages happen with no effort. They happen automatically. You don't have to do anything to reach the stage of an animal. But then there's one necessary level that we have to reach. We have to evolve one more time to become a human being with humanity and human values. Unfortunately, the stage we can't reach automatically. We can't just sit and wait until we become human beings. When we talk about human beings, we're talking about al-insan. Sometimes we refer to al-insan as the complete human being, al-insan al-kamil, the perfect human being. 
So you can't become a human being with humanity and human values just without doing anything, with no effort. You have to give the needed effort to evolve to become a human being with a pure heart, with a clean heart. No one will do that for you. No one. Not even the Prophet Not even the Prophet will do that. Yes, the Prophet comes, he gives you the ta'limat, he shows you the path, he shows you what you have to do, but no one will do this for you. If you cannot give the needed effort to turn yourself into a human being, then you most likely won't be a human being ever with human values. So this is why each and every one of us has to work on his own self, on his own heart, to turn it to a clean and sound heart so that he may recognize the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is basically a short addition that I wanted to mention today before I start with the next topic. So yesterday's lecture was the first introduction, let's say, to the series that I want to give, inshallah. Today, we'll have a second introduction. And tomorrow, inshallah, God willing, we will start with the series. The series, Lessons of Ashura. So the real talk, inshallah, will begin tomorrow. Yesterday, we had an introduction. Today, we're going to have a second introduction. And tomorrow, inshallah, we'll start with the first lesson, which will be the duty. We'll be talking about the duty and the taklif. Today's topic revolves around the importance of history, how we can benefit from any historical event and take the needed lesson from it. Because in order to understand today, we need, we need to look at yesterday because it's all tied together. It's all entangled. We cannot understand the way things are nowadays and today if we don't look back at history. But before I start with the topic too, I want to do a small and a short comparison. See how we never paid attention that the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually exist and that the problem is within ourselves and our hearts? We were assuming that the problem is from the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is not sending us signs. Whereas in reality, the signs exist, but the problem is our heart. So the problem is within the receiver, not the giver. Same thing with Ashura. We look at Ashura from far away. We don't analyze what happened in Ashura. We just hear that Imam al Hussein salam left Medina to Mecca. After that, he left to Iraq. He had a few companions. They left him. He went to Karbala. Uh, he got killed. After that, khalas, it's all done. Alhamdulillah. But we need to look a deeper look into Ashura. We need to go deep into the events of Ashura at some stations of Ashura so that we become aware of what really happened in Ashura. We don't do that. Same thing with the Quran. How many of us read the Quran in Shahar Ramadan, but just to read the Quran, they don't take a stop, they don't take a break to internalize these verses and reflect upon them. We just read the Quran, Alhamdulillah, I finish my juzit today, tomorrow I finish my juzit the next day, and then we finish the Quran. But we're just reading the Quran. I don't know, maybe some of you yesterday when I mentioned a few verses had this effect of, oh, like this verse is, I, I never paid attention to this verse in the Quran al-Kareem. Uh, because that's what happened to me. When I came across a few verses in the Quran while doing my research, I was surprised, like, how, how come I never paid attention to this verse before? That is because we read the Quran, just read the Quran without having uh, stops and uh, moments of reflection upon these verses. However, the same thing happens with us when we look at Ashura and the events of Ashura. That is why, inshallah, during this lesson, we will be looking, during this series, we'll be looking at lessons, at stations that happened, and we'll take the needed lesson from them, and we'll reflect upon them. 
to see if we can apply the things that Imam Hussein was trying to give us. Because Imam Hussein had a message that he wanted to deliver. Imam Hussein doesn't want us to sit and just cry over him and mourn over him. Of course, it is needed. But the real message of Imam Hussein, this is what we have to learn from Ashura and take from Ashura. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When it comes to historical events, we always have a group of people who say, why should I care about what happened in the past? What happened in the past happened already. It's not affecting me today in any way. I can't do anything about it. Let me just live my life. You know, YOLO at some point was like trending. You only live once, just live your life now. Don't worry about the future. Don't think about the past. Just live in the now. Um, why should I care about things that took place hundreds of years ago? How is that going to benefit me? How is that going to affect me? But such quote is very immature. Those who say such quotes, I don't mean to offend anyone, uh, are immature. Because history is one of the greatest teachers for us. And inshallah, during the lecture, we'll know why. <coughs> so, when we look at historical events, they help us build knowledge and a better understanding of how things are today. Without looking at history, we will not understand why certain things are the, are the way they are today. For example, Germany. I'm not mentioning Germany because I'm German. It's just like because the example will inshallah be, be clear. Because yesterday I mentioned Germany, today I'm mentioning Germany. Uh, I'm not biased yani, to Germany. The thing is about Germany, if we look at Germany today, I don't know if you know that Germany doesn't have nuclear weapons. They're not allowed to have nuclear weapons. If somebody comes and looks at Germany and asks, why is Germany not allowed to have any nuclear weapon? He won't understand why Germany is not allowed to have nuclear weapons unless he goes into history and does his research. And then he will understand that this is related to Germany leading two world wars within 40 years. If he looks at history, he'll know why Germany now isn't allowed to have nuclear weapons, a strong army, or whatsoever. Also, Germany is one of the leading export countries in the world. And this is related to history, too. Back then, you know we have the German highway, Autobahn, the legendary Autobahn with no speed limits. These were made by Hitler because he wanted to have fast transportation of troops and munition and all of that because he wanted to do lead the big world war and win it and, and whatsoever. So he made highways, the Autobahn. His intention was to win the war, to have like fast transportation of troops and munition, but they had benefits, like the war ended and everything, but these highways are still existent. So this led to Germany being one of the leading export countries. Taban, this is one of the reasons. It's not the main reason, it's one of the reasons. Because when you have faster transportation, you, you can be more productive. So this is just an example how looking at historical events can affect our understanding of today, of things that, of things that, um, uh, what? No. So that's why when we look at historical events, we understand how things are today, the way they are. I can give you a different example that maybe you can relate, uh, relate to more. Um, when people have marriage problems and they approach me and want advice, at some point I don't understand why they are behaving like this, why he's acting like this, why she's reacting like this. But the deeper they, they, like the more they open up and talk about their problems, the more I understand them. Because it's all related to their history. 
because he's acting in this way because of what happened in the past and she's acting in this way because of what happened in the past. But if they don't tell me what's happened in the past, I'll just have a question mark. Like, w why would you act like this if she acts in this way? Type. So however, these are just a few examples of how looking back at historical events or things that happened in the past affect our understanding of today. طيب. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد. So each stage and era of the human life has similarities, be it in a political aspect or social aspect or uh, economic aspect. But however diverse these stages are, they are similar in terms of historical rules, historical norms that rule societies. So they can be different in details, but there's one historical rule that is above them, that rules them. That is why Imam Ali alayhi salam says in Nahj al-Balagha the following. He says, you should take a lesson from the fate of the progeny of Ismail the children of Isaac and the children of Israel. How similar are their affairs and how akin are their examples? Because these similarities become a teacher and a lesson and the example for future generations. When we look at them, we don't do the same mistakes that were done by those before us. They become a teacher because these sunan Al-Ilahiyya, these universal laws repeat themselves. Halla, I will cl clarify it a bit more. So history has stages and levels and rulings that reoccur if necessary conditions applied. Once these conditions apply, then the godly law will be, uh, will be activated and take place. For example, when we talk about As-Sunan Al-Ilahiyya, which I translate with the godly laws, the universal laws, whenever there are zalimun, there will be a punishment. Allah will send halak upon them. Wherever there are zalimun, there will be a punishment. They won't have the same punishment. They will have a different type of punishment, but the punishment is one. This is one of the godly rulings, godly laws. Wherever there is zulum, there will be punishment. There's no escape. If somebody is not on the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving him victory and his religion victory, Allah will replace them for with people who will be successors of his religion, who will give victory to his religion. And it's easy on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to replace people. many, there's something that popped to my head right now. If we reflect upon us and the life that we're living right now, because sometimes we zoom in too much into life. But if you want to zoom out a bit and take a further look from far away, we're living for 80, 90 years on planet Earth. And after 100 years, the child that is born today won't be existing. It's like you go on your laptop and you click refresh and everything just changes so each 100 years there's a complete new humanity on earth we don't pay attention to this fact because we are living in the now and we don't zoom out but each and every one of us all the problems that are going on on the world right now all the economic problems the wars and everything that's happening you know there's people maybe right now in japan stuck in traffic having worries about like the future, about the kids, about what's going to happen. But in 100 years, none of the people that are living nowadays hella on earth will be living. They will all be gone. They will all be gone. So sometimes we just need to zoom out to, to see that this life is nothing. 
like close your eyes, open your eyes. In, in Lebanese, يعني باللبناني, we say, غمد عينك, فتح عينك, بتكون خلصت. يعني just close your eyes and open your eyes, and life is over. It's done. طيب. <coughs> so we were talking about the godly, or God's universal loss. Also, the Quran talks about historical events a lot. If we look at the Quran as the book of guidance, of the book of guidance for humanity until the day of judgment, and we see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in this book, because Allah Azza wa is going to choose wisely what he wants to put in this book, which is made of 600 pages, that should guide us until the day of judgment. He's going to pick wisely what he's going to mention. And then if we look at the Quran, and he mentions a lot of stories from prophets that were living before us, before the Holy Prophet ﷺ, mentions stories from those who were living before us and tells us to reflect upon what happened to them. The Quran orders us to reflect upon those that were living before us because the past and history shall be one of the greatest teachers for us. One of the verses mentions the following. Indeed, there have been examples before you. Therefore, travel in the earth and see what the end of the rejecters was. The scholars say that this, this verse is ordering us to reflect on ahwal al madin those who were living before us, because we shall take the needed lesson from those who were living before us. And who better than Imam Ali alayhi salam could summarize what I am trying to explain to you? Imam Ali alayhi salam said to Al Imam al Hassan in his will the following, which summarizes the idea that I'm trying to tell you in, in these words. He tells him, My son, even though I have not reached the age of those before me. I have looked into their behavior and contemplated over their accounts. I walked in their footsteps until I became one of them. In fact, by virtue of what I have learned about them, it's as if I have lived with all of them from the very first unto the very last. So Imam Ali alayhi salam is telling Al Imam al Hassan that I reflected upon their lives and what they did as if I was living with them, with all of them. So one of the teachers of Imam Ali alayhi salam is history, is the past events. He learned from the experience of those who were before him. And he is telling Imam al Hassan alayhi salam about this fact. He's telling him, if you look at those who were living before you, if you take their experience, then you will have their experience. You don't have to do it yourself because you know, we as a human beings, most of the time, we don't learn until we do the thing ourselves. We have to do the mistake first and then we learn from our mistake. We can see that clearly with the kids. When we get the teapot and it's still hot and we put it on the table and the kid sees the teapot, we tell him, no, don't go, don't touch it. But he still runs to it and he touches it. And once he burns himself, he recognizes that, ah, it's hot, I shouldn't have touched it. But he has to do it himself first. Same thing when we tell our kids and children, Habibi, brush your teeth. If you don't brush your teeth, they will get yellow. You have to go to the dentist, you'll have problems later on. He doesn't believe us because he, he goes to bed he sleeps, he wakes up the next day, he looks in the mirror, he still finds his teeth fine. They're not yellow, nothing happened to them. But after a few weeks, days, years, he recognizes that, no, what my parents told me was right. Same thing with the ibadat, with uh, the worships, with salah, siyam, and everything else. We tell our brothers and sisters, please pray. Don't neglect your prayer. Please fast. Please do your wajibat. If you don't do that, your heart, your heart will die. They don't pay attention. They don't believe that their heart will die because they, they didn't pray for a certain time. Oh, they still don't pray. 
and they think they're fine. Alhamdulillah, I'm living normally, even though I don't pray. I have money, I'm happy, I can travel, I eat, I go, I see my friends. So why should I pray? I see the ones who pray have a worse life than me. They have it worse than me. So Alhamdulillah, I'm good even if I don't pray. But he's not aware of the fact that his heart is dying. When it's too late, maybe there's no way back. So same thing with like brushing the teeth example. It's the same concept. If you don't pray, if you neglect your prayer, if you neglect your wajibat, then maybe you will wake up when it's too late. So don't neglect your worships. طيب, so this is just to clarify the point of how uh, we can learn and benefit from historical events. One of the greatest historical events, one of the greatest teachers is the event of Ashura. Because the event of Ashura is an event that is continuous in all its elements. One of our greatest scholars says that Ashura is connected with everything in Islam. He says all that we have is from Ashura. All that we have is from Ashura. Because Ashura is a school that brings forth countless and infinite lessons. And I'm not exaggerating when I say countless and infinite lessons. And each lesson unfolds life, knowledge, and guidance. Each lesson could be life-changing for each and every one of us. That is why when we look at Ashura, let me say this before I, before I go into the chapters. Ashura has the special place because Ashura was embodying and manifesting human values. That is why even if someone else, even if another Imam other than al Hussein ibn Ali stood on the battlefield, Ashura would still have the same importance. Because Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, just like the other Imams, was manifesting human values at their finest. So by killing him in this manner, they aspired to despise and demolish human values. That is why Ashura is an event that knows no language, no color, no borders. Every human being that hears about Imam al Hussein and what happened to him gets affected by Imam al Hussein. Because Imam al Hussein is not only for us, Imam al Hussein is for all of us, for every human being, for every revolutionary. Everyone who hears about Imam al Hussein gets affected, feels related to Imam al-Hussein because Imam al-Hussein was embodying these values, the human values in Ashura. So, however, when we talk about the event of Ashura, we can define, uh, divide the studies into many chapters. Mainly, they mention two. The first chapter is studying the underlying causes and motives of Imam Hussein's revolution. Why did he do the revolution? Why did he go? Why did he set out? Be it from a political aspect or religious aspect or whatsoever. We are not going to talk about, about this chapter. The second chapter is identifying the lessons of Ashura, to take the needed lessons, what happened before Imam al Hussein went. We'll take a look at some stages and reflect upon them to see what really happened at that time. So we will be talking about lessons of Ashura in the upcoming nights, and we will start with the lesson of Al-Taklif, the duty like I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture. I just want to leave a note. It's very important that each and every one of us reflects upon these lessons starting tomorrow because if we do not reflect upon these lessons and internalize them, we won't understand the greatness of Ashura and the greatness of Imam al Hussein, the greatness of what he did in Ashura. I, so I request, I ask each and every one of you to take some time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes after the lecture, maybe the next day, to just reflect upon what was said. 
because in this way we can reap the most benefits, insha'Allah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us hearts and minds that allow us to benefit from any historical event in the best possible way. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين